<clears throat> so uh, it's a great honor to be with you. Um, I'm going to go slow today. I usually go fast, and so I'm going to go slow because this is really, really important what we're doing here at ESIP. Um, the uh, climate literacy uh, push in the United States started uh, in September of 2005, and uh, I was given a mantle, a mission by NOAA, uh, and then eventually by U.S. Global Change Research Program to make the nation climate literate. Um, we had no idea what that meant, uh, so the first thing we had to do to define it, and we had no resources, we had no budget, we had no programs, we had no community, we had no networks, um, and we didn't have much of an understanding of our history. It turns out there's a lot more history there than we thought. But uh, one of the things I'm thinking about you guys and where you are and why the ESIP community is such an important piece. And, and I started jo you know, joining this community back when I was with NASA under the Landsat mission. Um, and, but you know, the, the, the idea of education, I mean, in the previous talks, the connection between data societal applications of information that we use and education was made. But I'm gonna try and unpack that a little bit more. And one of the things we've been doing as a community that has grown up around this is um, really strengthen the critical aspect of education. Because a lot of times it's an afterthought. It's a, uh, we're doing this thing and then there's education over there. And it's like, you know, it's, it's uh, just over there. But I think, what we are coming to realize is that it is, it is a critical piece, and especially the topics we're talking about and the issues that we face and the, the move on those issues across the, the world, um, these are multi-decadal issues. And if you don't think about education as a critical piece of multi-decadal issues, you're gonna continue to run into the same wall over and over again. And we know what that means. It's kind of insanity, right? So maybe it's time to stop thinking about it that way and really take a, a, a serious look, and I think ESIP's leadership in helping us do this, at how do we build the capacity to understand, utilize, and move forward on this data. So this, this idea in your strategic plan about connecting communities to observations is a really critical and important piece of it, and I appreciate that the community has made that, that commitment. And so we're going to look at that and how do we really move forward on that commitment in a serious way. Um, so, you know, uh, Johanna, who, who introduced me, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have her as a partner in our community, and I were part of the COP21 Paris Agreement. Uh, I was representing the U.S. government on youth engagement and education. It's part of my many hats that I wear. And, uh, you know, we also had the, the, uh, the, the honor to be part of the President's Climate Action Plan that was highlighted uh, in Paris uh, through education and, and literacy, uh, which we just are closing out in 10 days um, under this, this administration. It was a great honor to be part of that. But I think the, the thing that, that came through in the Paris Agreement was the world pivoted. The world said, we now fully accept the science that our community and beyond has been working so hard for so long to make the case that this is a critically important issue, an issue among all issues. In fact, some people make the case that it's the super issue. It's the issue above all issues because of its impact across the centuries and across the decades and across the generations. So, um, but if we're gonna do that, and then just to give you a little, clue as to how I use the colors. Anytime I'm talking about green in this image, I'm thinking about something where your community really needs to help us. So I'm just trying to signal to you when I use green, some of the, the text and the, the language we've been building across the years um, is, is now pivoting to skills. Because if you don't, if you have access to information, and you don't have the skills to use it effectively toward your outcome, it really, it, I think it's another aspect of just having access to it, which we've seen in the previous talks, is tremendously important. But if you don't have skillful use in using that information toward your outcome, I think that we haven't gone far enough. And so this, this, we've moved from knowledge and awareness into skill development toward making better decisions. 
Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of what we were doing there. But in order to build those skills, both within the United States and beyond the United States, is a very substantial amount of work. And it's going to take a long time, and it's going to be slow, methodical work. So, you know, let's, let's, let's uh, hopefully we can in, in do it together. So if you look at the actual agreement, and then the fact that this actually happened, 21 years we've been struggling to get this agreement. And we've completely restructured the, the way we would get that agreement with individualized in, you know, uh, commitments, not as top-down legally mandated commitments. And that opened up the space. But inside of that is Article 12, which says that education, training, and capacity building are key to the success of the agreement. Now, most of the focus was on other parts of the agreement, as usual. Because again, we always focus on the non-education stuff and the education is taking care of itself. I think we can say that's not sufficient. The education piece is not taking care of itself because the students that are in school and the citizens who are out of school are not skillful in using our information to make societal decisions, personally or in a community context. Does anybody refute that statement? I'm going to take a little while here. Does anybody refute that statement? Because if, it, if you don't refute it, I think it puts us in a position to be culpable in solution for it, right? We have to be part of that solution. If you're, if you're a community that cares deeply about data, skillfully building and using data, you have to be part of the process that actually builds the societal skill to using that data towards societal outcome, right? So, you know, we, we're giving you platform through a, our new cluster to join us in that enterprise. Um, now, we've talked about this for a really long time. Uh, back in 2010, 2009, Congress chartered NOAA to fund the National Academies uh, to come up with something kind of unique. How many of you remember the America Climate Choices? Wow. The NRC has got to do a better job, guys, um, because this was really important work because what they, the Congress said was, tell us what we should do about climate change. Usually they don't do that. They just say, give us the sense of the understanding of the community, but don't make recommendations. They actually told the, the NRC to convene panels to tell them what to do about climate change. Now, in 2010, one of them, it called out education and, and communications as critical pieces of, you know, this, uh, I've always liked this idea of bringing the hidden hazards to the public attention. Now, I don't think, you know, uh, attention, understanding, and action. Embedded in that is actually that they are skillfully understanding how to use our information in order based on that hidden hazard. But it's in there. But again, you know, the, you testified that, that this is the case. Yesterday, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which I'm uh, honored to be a part of, uh, released its triennial update for its strategic plan. That's a new word. I've never heard of triennial update, but there it is, um, every three years. Uh, and in there, it, it continues to affirm that, that you know, we have a goal to communicate and educate, to advance communications and uh, education, to broaden public understanding of climate, uh, global change, and develop scientific workforce for the future. So, but, but in order for us to actually do that, we need a much bigger engine than what we can do through just the federal agencies. So that's part of why ESIP is such a critical piece of this. Um, but you know, I appreciate that that the something that my office is part of, and members of this community are deeply involved in the the, the Climate Explorer, and as part of the, the President Obama's launched uh, toolkit for the Climate Resilience Toolkit. But I venture to say that that this work, as critical as it is, if we don't build the skill within communities and decision makers to use this information and the implications of it, and this is model output, not just the observed data, but if they, we don't build that in communities, their ability to use the tool is, you know, we don't, we don't give people advanced tools without training. And that training is also important in society through education. Remember, one in four people in the nation is a student. One in, that's a little bit, it's between one in four and one in five. One in four, one in five. That's a really large segment of society. And we tend to spend something like 20 years going through formalized training. 
However, so this is a picture I found of a school in Philadelphia. <clears throat> I was, um, let's see, in 1971, I was, no, this is 72. I was starting school in Philadelphia, it's 1972. I am now 51. Uh, what I learned in my classrooms between then in the public schools in Philadelphia, uh, I went to England for a little while, uh, I went to college in Temple University, I went to college for 12 years. It wasn't until I went to Johns Hopkins that I really started seriously in my advanced degrees getting into the stuff that we talk about in this community. I had almost no preparation in earth sciences at all. I had to reteach myself earth sciences because I was asked to teach it. So we have to appreciate that the other people in this image who are my peers and our peers really in this country, uniquely in the world, are not prepared to use our information. They don't understand it. They have really core misconceptions. They really don't have the skill in order to use our information. I'm trying to emphasize, and maybe I've hit that nail so hard, the nail's below the piece of wood. That's okay, it's worth it. Um, the, the work that we do as a community is dealing with a, 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 an adult population that really is not skillful. Solving that is, requires a unique set of strategies, but let's not only focus on that community while we have an opportunity to work through the education systems, formal, informal, uh, place-based, and really build up their skill with the stuff that is so important now we, if we don't do it then and we keep on focusing on the, the, the reactionary approaches to adult education, which is really, really, really hard. It's much easier, it turns out, to work with kids when they're in a formative stage and they actually have to do it and the teachers are fo focused on these issues. So let's you know, look at that as well. So in order for us to put some, some guide rails and how to focus on this, back in 2009, we set up a framework on the climate literacy framework and turns out just writing a document turned out to be a pretty powerful thing to do. It's guided a lot of the standards that are being used across the nation right now. It's guided programs that were federally funded up th from 2008 to 2000, currently now. The, the funding curve obviously has gone down. It'll come back, um, but this turned out to be an incredibly important framework for how to move forward on this issue. However, yeah, actually, I'm going to go back a step. However, you know, in 2009, we didn't appreciate the reality of how important the skill development was and how the interplay between data and decision making and model outputs and decision making was as we do now. It, it, you know, we called out certain things, but we really didn't get into the, the, the core elements of what your community focus on here. So we have to augment that approach. And it's been an evolving organic approach, but I think that the, the data science and the media literacy related to data science has shown up as more and more important over the years. So I'm gonna focus on that a little bit, just so you can see that. But there's another aspect that I'm gonna reinforce this point. The, the, the triangle is the U.S. Global Change Research Program's approach to how they do their work. Um, you know, you advance the science, you prepare, you know, prepare the nation for change, you assess the climate science. I'm, I'm on the steering committee of the National Climate Assessment. It's a critical piece of what we do in this room here as well, pieces of it. Um, we provide the tools, make the science accessible, all toward the decision maker. Sometimes that decision maker is a mayor, sometimes it's a governor, sometimes it's elected officials, sometimes it's a citizen. But all the blue circles is what I've been focusing on, which is if you focus only at the decision maker at the time they make the decision, you've forgotten about all that work that was building the skill and knowledge and approach to how the decision maker makes the decision, which is for decades before that decision point. If you only focus on the decision point and the social context of that decision, it's gonna make it really hard. We're in a democracy. We don't make decisions by ourselves. We have to work within the context of constituencies. So if you, we are trying to focus on that, but realize that that means we should have been doing the work that we're talking about three decades ago, four decades ago. 
in order to have the citizenry and the decision makers ready to use our science now. So that, that you could say that that's a failing. It's just a, it's a challenge. But if we don't focus on the decision makers and the social context now in the youth that we have, in four decades, three decades, they're really gonna have a hard time using our, our information effectively, while also dealing with the adult population that is currently making those decisions and supporting those decisions in a variety of different ways. So that's a, it's an interesting, vexing problem. But good news is, uh, part, partly what we did through the White House when we um, launched, you know, expanded the President's Climate Action Plan for, uh, for education and literacy was to convene meetings at the White House. Turns out when you have an invitation from the White House, people just show up. They don't ask for travel support. They just show up. It's an amazing thing. It worked. We thought it might, and it did. Um, and a lot of youth came in. Uh, due to the leadership of some of my colleagues at the White House. And what they did was they actually convened meetings with young people who have already demonstrated an interest in the, these topics and asked them, why is this important to you? What do you want to do? And how, how are you feeling supported? And they had a lot to say. And so that's Gina McCarthy, a key person in, in, in the, the Climate Action Plan, listening. John Holdren was in those rooms. A lot of key influential people in this administration who had a lot of really important movement on that decision space. And they had some interesting things to say that I think are germane to this conversation. Ooh, that's not going to work. Um, sorry, guys. I didn't realize the room dynamics. But um, I'll give you a couple of key pieces, right? They, they want an opportunity to lead. We learned this in Paris extensively. Young people who are in the you know, 10 to 25 range absolutely have a voice on this issue, climate and global change. They want to be heard. They don't want to be the decision maker in the future. They want the decision makers to hear them now because they think that the issues that are being decided on now are actually critical to their future. And they don't want to wait to be the decision maker. They want the decision makers today to hear them. So really important piece. They're not shy. They are really bold and powerful. And I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch as an educator. Um, they want cultural differences to be appreciated and respected. Uh, they want to be connected to this issue. They don't feel the time on this issue in what they focus on in school and educational uh, programming is anywhere near sufficient to what they feel is important. They feel like they're getting focused on all these un, unimportant, less relevant things when this really big thing like the educators are avoiding. Stop that. Um, they want to, another really important thing is they want this integrated across their curriculum. They don't want to just focus on this in a science classroom or even an earth science classroom. They see this as all over the curriculum and we should be acting as such. Um, clearly the issues we talked about here show up in a lot of different parts of the curriculum. It challenges us very hard, but that's okay. It's our problem, we should fix it. Um, they definitely want it to be focused on an interdisciplinary, as I said, but they, they um, and they want opportunities. They want to step up, and so I think, you know, one thing I, as I'm looking in the room, if you have young people who are in, say, middle school or high school, they're willing to work really hard for you for free any day of the week if you can connect them. Um, they want those opportunities. They're brilliant young people that I think that if you give them the opportunity, they'll run hard. Not all of them, trust me, I know, but some of them. And but they want to jump in there. And I think if you know, as I, as I gained you know understanding across the years as a teacher, um, you know, there's a lot of more you can do beyond the classroom that opens up space. And you. Uh, uh, Amber, I think you mentioned Bill Gates used to jump on the mainframe at three in the morning just to get access. That's one of the reasons why that, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. Well, um, they are ready to jump in. Um, and so I'll give them the opportunity because they're going to do brilliant things if you give them the, the, give them the access. Um, so just another thing to signal out. Um, this is just another way of looking. I just grabbed a, 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 a one high school in one city and looked at their science curriculum. And, and you think about the conversation we were having. And you think about that, it shows up in a lot more parts of the curriculum because we have a really structured, I'm, I'm going to get, all, I'm gonna get all on a soapbox for a second if I haven't already been on one. We do a great disservice to our science in the nation. Um, when it comes to high school, 
we do not take earth science or system science anywhere near seriously. It's one of the hardest and most rigorous and challenging sciences. I've had the two decades between NOAA and NASA to, to work with you guys. I get it. But I mean, you know, physics, chemistry, biology in high school as the and then AP physics, AP bio, AP chem and, you know, anatomy and physiology. Where's earth systems? Where the is it? Sorry. I have to edit myself sometimes. It really bothers me a great deal that we take this science that we've been doing for centuries, decades, um, and take it to such an important level, and yet we do such disrespect in our schools by not approaching it seriously. The kids want it deeply. Not all of them. They'll get there. They love it when they do. But the, the, if you look at this, there is no Earth system science. There's no AP Earth system science. Um, it's not there. So th there's some really structural challenges before us. But the, another opportunity for us is these new standards, the next generation science standards, the NRC framework for science education. They have been adapted and changed a little bit by some states. It's the most dominant science education reform that's going on right now. And key to this are these science and engineering practices which is embedded in the content, not like you learn to practice and then the rest of the year you just you know, remember information. Look at those circles. And the reason why all those lines are connecting all across is because the, you, know, you don't learn one and then the next and then the next. They're all interchangeable and interwoven as we do the scientific process. But some of these are skills that are such critical pieces to what we're doing in this community that if we have the ability for the next couple of decades to really build up in our students the, these skills, it'll be an investment in the future that'll yield when we are struggling with the next phase of the science that we do and the data access and then using that to make the informed decision domestically and beyond. This is gonna pay a huge dividend if they do it well. You guys live and breathe this, a lot of these pieces. Your expertise inside the educational system, teachers do not know how to do this yet. This is freaking them out, and there's no support for them. They've been told to do it, and now they don't know how to do it. So the more you can do to show them how do you obtain, evaluate, and communicate information, I think you guys have something to do about that. If, you know, answering, uh, asking and answering questions based on data, really important piece. Engaging in our argumentation, our argument from evidence, I think you've got something to say about that. That skill that you've built up uh, is, is, you know, it's worth making the investment backward to make sure that the next group doesn't have to work as hard to get as advanced as you are, uh, uh, you know. So another piece that I've, you know, again, I'm, I'm the, the parent of climate literacy for the U.S. Um, and we, we, we didn't really get the data literacy part right. And, you know, there's different people who talk about this and think about this. I don't know if our communities really sat down and thought about what does data literacy mean, but it's really about critical reasoning. And I think that those previous standards are embedded in this, but, you know, information literacy, I think we already talked about this in the previous conversations about how do you access, I mean, that whole point about, you know, citizen measurements of, of air quality and whether it's skillful and quality information and being able to derive, you know, that's, that's not a really good measurement because it came from this source and, and, and hasn't been, you know, reviewed, but don't make a decision based on that, but look at this other data. That's a sophisticated analysis that, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of spurious information out there, especially about climate and global change. Sorting through it all, really, really piece. Statistical information, I've come to appreciate AP statistics and, and probability so much more um, than I did historically. So, you know, and then just general data literacy. I think we as a community might be positioned to have something to say about this. Oh, that didn't come out right. So there's some, that there, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll sh I don't, do we share the slides? Do you guys want these? If you want them, just let me know. Because there's some th that nuggets I've been looking at, and this is from librarian science. Really, fi I find librarian science to be incredibly important. I've always loved librarians in schools. I didn't appreciate the, how important they were until after I left the schools. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much detail, but there's a, a lot of rich thinking that I think is important for our community to consider, but I, I don't think it's far enough because uh, Matt Nisbeth, uh, in part of our, our previous work, 
called out that it's not just that, it's also in the civic skills and the media literacy. So it's just the data literacy, but then the application of access to data through media is another piece of that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think that Matt did some really fine work in calling this out for us. If we haven't realized that citizens have a hard time sorting through credible post-fact information, I mean, you know, we got to help them. And we do credible work and we do it carefully, but they see one data plot versus another data plot and they don't have the ability to discern which is credible and which is not yet. We have to do a better job of that. But I love this photograph. And the reason I love this photograph is because it's not just about all what we've been talking about. It's also about jobs. We realize that our economy is not working for a lot of people. Education is critical to jobs as well. We build the future workforce. This job right here is the fastest growing job in the nation. Bet you didn't know that. What this job is, is a person goes up on a wind turbine, they love ropes, climbers, you know anybody? They got a great opportunity because this person slides down the front, ed the leading edge of the wind turbine and looks at cracks and deformations and erosion uh, on that to make sure that the blade doesn't fail because if it fails, the whole thing blows up. Uh, and usually there's a second person on the backside. They do it in a pair. This is the fastest growing job in the nation right now. Faster than anything else. Solar installers is, is right up there. Coal miners, not so much. Um, and I'm not making a political statement. I'm just looking at the jobs number. But these people are early entry jobs. The people that are really having a hard time making it. This, th this move that came out of Paris is going to push us to going to very rapid energy transformation. And it's going to change the jobs. But the, the, this person, I remember when I was talking with climate change with a seventh grader one time, and he said, yeah, I think I get your, your point. But uh, he asked me the best question I've ever been asked. And I'm going to open up the questions in a second, so I don't mean as a setup. But um, he said, you know, I get this, but are all the jobs going to change? Because what I want to know is, I'm seventh grade, what am I going to take in eighth grade and ninth grade and tenth grade and eleventh grade to prepare me for a job? Which job should I prepare for? This is a job. This is a real job that, and you don't even have to have a college degree. I've backed off on the importance of college degrees. It's a really hard thing for a teacher to say. But it turns out there are a lot of people that aren't going to go into college. They're just going to go directly into a trade or a workforce uh, right after high school. This job you can do, you can get a good, good salary, uh, it's stable. This is going to be around for a really long time. Um, so I think that, that there's, there's an emerging priority here, but I see that because, you know, the, the, the climate change is bringing economic challenges, but it's also bringing huge economic opportunities. We need to highlight where the opportunities are because the motivation for a kid to really focus on the stuff we're doing also relates to jobs. And this is just one job. There's a lot of other jobs out there in this, this emerging sector. Um, but I want to I want to just close out my, my remarks with uh, thanking the ESIP community because you guys have accepted us as a cluster, as the clean network. And what the clean network is is we knew back in 2008 when we started this that we needed a community. We didn't have one. Um, we've grown a community outside of ESIP, and now ESIP is giving us an opportunity to add some more structure, more um, support to really doing the hard work of building network and building community response, building a collective impact. Um, and you know, we wouldn't be able to make the pivots we're making right now. Clearly, the federal investments in the work that we're doing are going down. We're the first thing to go, guys. Um, you know, data, you guys are going to probably have servers and, and observation networks for you know, without any challenge. Education, we're already zeroed out. Um, so we're going to have to transition all of our work into the community. Uh, community partners are going to play a critical role. They're already showing up in droves. We need a better network structure in order to work through external uh, channels as opposed to internal channels. This is something that you guys, uh, whether you knew this or not, ESIP has done this for us. And we, we uh, have a great deal of, of gratitude and support. And we would love to have you work with us to move that forward. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs. And the reason why it is because, you know, for the longest time, for a decade, I've been teaching about climate change and I could feel the seats in the room get deeper and heavier from the weight of the people sitting in them. And all I was doing is talking and showing images. 
This is actually the winners of the solar decathlon a few years ago, and these guys are not feeling the weight of the world on them. They're figuring out how to redesign sit, uh, houses to work at a zero carbon, zero energy capacity, and actually be houses somebody would want to live in. Um, and they're stoked. They're excited. They see this opportunity and they are running full steam at it as opposed to feeling demoralized and, and taken down and, uh, and depressed and sticking their head in the sand as a result. Um, I need more of this. We need more of this because that, that passion and that power and that enterprise that they have is, is an immense uh, engine for us. Remember, one in four, you know, one in 4.5 people is a student. These are students too. I can't remember which university they're in, but this is amazing work. Um, and uh, the more we can move this forward, the more we can uh, transition to this new economy that's happening worldwide. And we didn't even talk about resilience planning. Um, that's, that's, that's a whole nother beast, but that's important too. Anyway, I, I should probably stop there. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Indeed, this is amazing work. Thank you so much, Frank. You know, I feel your passion about your work, and I, you know, really appreciate all you have contributed to ESIP and to this cluster. So, it's so inspirational that now I want to jump right into that cluster. Anyway, so um, do we have questions there, Brian. Howdy, Frank. Uh, Brian, we from uh, Napkin and Company, a risk and uh, environmental risk management firm. So Frank, question um, goes to you about um, 21st century skills for the emerging workforce and how that may be a vehicle to not quite offload climate literacy, but use to leverage uh, issues about climate literacy. I mean, so is, what, what inspired me to think about this question were, were your slides. You had a slide there about science and engineering practice and you had a slide there about critical thinking, which reflected a lot of the work behind reports by the National Education Association and also industry groups, very critically industry groups like DuPont and I think 3M and those other guys who said, look, there's a series of critical thinking skills for, for the emerging workforce for the 21st century and amongst them are critical thinking communication, which is something Krista pointed out in her talk. Um, and I cannot remember what are, are the other ones, but collaboration, critical thinking, sure. you know, blah, blah, blah. So the question goes back to you. Um, since you express concern about future funding for explicit climate work yeah. and the fact that, you know, these 21st century skills have been also called out by industry, um, how do you see yourself, your, your community? Not again, I hate to use the word offload, but how do you see that lab, that, that critical, critical thinking skill work? How do you see that, let you, that you'll be able to leverage that to your advantage? So, so there's an interesting uh, body of work on skills. Um, developing skills is one thing. One of the things that's really important in skill development is this idea of transferable skill. Sometimes what happens, there's educational research to support this. So um, what happens is, if you build a skill related to an issue, sometimes you put it in a silo and you only use that skill in the context of that situation. You don't use it as a universal skill or a transferable skill, use it only in this instance. And then when you come up with another time, you should be using that skill. You don't because you think it's only applicable over here. So um, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is, is uh, relevance in learning is a really, really important piece. Uh, turns out, remember the photograph of the students at the White House with, with Gina McCarthy? They are highly motivated to learn because they see climate and dealing with climate change as something that is utterly important to them personally. They are motivated learners. I got kids, my kids, <laughs> uh, I'm a proud father, but sometimes they drive me crazy because they aren't motivated to learn until they get motivated the, the, the engine to do the work of 21st century skill development personally, as inside the student, is really challenging. Turns out these issues that we deal with are incredibly relevant to what they want to learn about. 
So if you couple relevance and 21st century skill and transferable skill, you get a really nice nexus. The stuff we care about is also important to other issues. Air quality is not a climate change thing. It's, a, it's another ocean acidification is related to climate change, but it's its own global change issue. So the, we've got a, a cascade of really important issues, including climate change, that we need skills to be able to deal with all of them. So I think you know my recipe is relevance, transferable skills, and 21st century. And I very much appreciate, I think one of the things that's gonna help us in the next few years is going to corporates where they see the future of the, uh, the, the economy that they're working towards, um, what they have to call for these, this work, and a lot of them are calling for the work at the, that intersection between climate change and global change is relevant issues, transferable skills in the 21st century. We need them to call that out. You know, we've done it. Now they need to do it so that that education system responds accordingly at a commensurate system-wide response as opposed to early adopters that are just, you know, great teachers over here, but the 20 over there on the other side of the hall, not so much. Oh, that's a long answer, but you know, hopefully it worked. Yes, please. All right, so in the spirit of being interdisciplinary, I kind of want to ask you a question that links together the first talk with what you were talking about. Do you have, oh, I'm Shana Skolnick from NAVTECA, and we're using technology to address a lot of these um, climate change issues through data visualization uh, using innovative technology. So my question is, is there a way to use calm technology to create some sort of feedback that regular people would see all the time that would signal to them a, an interpretation of data. So this is kind of putting you on the spot, but it was something that yeah. just occurred to me is, you know, what if we had a system of lights that just automatically triggered people to understand, you know, sea level rise or understand air quality issues? So that's my question. So, so um, this may not totally address what you're looking at. And, and I think there are a couple pieces of what Amber said that I really resonated with. Um, you know, use the level of technology, the minimum level of technology needed, right? But there's another piece that, that is clear that when we look at adaptation responses and mitigation responses, and you, you ask communities, are, how much are we doing versus how much they are doing, whether they know it or not. So when you see a storm drain being worked on in your community, you have no idea that they took, you know, um, extreme precipitation projections into the size of those pipes, right? You just see a pipe, you see them in hole, you don't know that that's twice the size of the previous one. And the reason why they're doing it is because they know that extreme flooding is gonna happen. Same is true for Ikea, right? The roofs of Ikeas are covered with solar panels, but if you drive in the parking lot, you don't see them because they're on the top of the building where they should be. You don't see them, so you don't have no idea that the transformation that's happening is actually occurring. Or that the building, like I have no idea what's happening with the electrons that are in this building. Are they coming from renewable sources or are they coming from coal or nuclear, which is probably where they're coming from. I have no idea. So a lot of the solutions that are already underway are completely hidden to us, both on adaptation, mitigation. Um, you know, climate change is that we're in polluted air. It's odorless, tasteless, and invisible, but it's still polluted. Um, thanks to EPA, thank you. Um, but uh, it's, it's invisible. So making the transformations, both of the problem and the solutions visible through whatever mechanism, uh, whether it's technology or not, is gonna be a critical piece because it sets the new norm. If it feels like we're not making progress, why start? And we're already making tremendous progress, but is, most of that progress is hidden. Unless you drive an electric car, and I didn't see too many in the parking lot, Mine is there, just shaming you guys. Um, it's a great car. Uh, but my point is, is that, that, that a lot of the stuff is, is, is missing from what we experience and see. And that's a really important uh, concept. How you do it is, I think, uh, we need to be more intentional about it. So I'm not sure what this is going on over here. One more question, anybody? Either way, I'll be in, up, oh, uh, Brian, we're coming back. Um, 
Hopefully, this is a um, note on a bright point, um, despite what's happening uh, this year. I mean, you said you didn't want to get into a political soapbox, and I'm not trying to do that either. But um, one, your, your mention of corporate, the, the role of corporate partners um, actually has inspired this comment. It's more of a comment, but I'll let it get your reaction. So uh, as it turns out, Senator Whitehouse, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, this morning had, had a very good um, a very good piece in, in the Washington Post. Um, it was an editorial piece, but he, he talked uh, about what's really happening behind the scenes in Congress, uh, including you know people from both parties. And 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 so so the the I, I hate to say this, but I I need to say this, otherwise I'm going to be talking in code. But the bottom line is not all Republicans are bad guys as far as climate goes. So it's it's a good piece because it reflects some of the things that I've heard talking to um, Capitol Hill staffers. But um, the, the encouraging point in, in, in that editorial from Senator Whitehouse who, um, is the role, actually, of corporate partners. He mentioned that, and that was how actually he closed out. Um, and, and, and so from your experiences at, at, you know, with, with, with the climate negotiations and your experiences at the climate program office at NOAA, what what has been the what what's, what's been the, the tone of the signal from um, the corporate world in terms of s supporting either explicitly or implicitly climate change education? Because actually that was called out in Senator Senator White House's uh, opinion piece today right. that the corporate guys may not necessarily run up and shout "Yay, climate!" but you know if there's some quiet way that in which it can be done, yeah. they might actually get behind you. So, so there are two pieces of your question that are really intriguing. Part one is corporations are moving rapidly in this direction. They have already accepted our science. They've already interpreted it. They're already moving forward on adaptation responses and mitigation responses in bold, fast ways. They would like us some stabilization in the market, the signal, but, but they're moving ahead independent of that. Uh, they know that, you know that they're getting hammered by their infrastructure by climate change, and they know that they need to deal with the root cause uh, through mitigation strategies. They get that. Um, and they've been very vocal. So when I was in Paris, uh, we were up in Le Bourget doing the negotiations, but down in Paris, my brother-in-law happens to be working in this field uh, in the, in the, on the corporate side, and he was in meetings with corporate leaders and, and insurance company leaders from worldwide in the city hall of Paris doing exactly what you're calling for, right? So that, that, that's the hidden piece, the mayors, the cities, they're doing amazing work in this area. So, um, however, however, they're doing that, but they're not also making the social investments in the future workforce that is going to be critical to the multi-decadal transformation that they're calling for. So corporate are shirking their responsibilities, in my opinion, and I'm speaking as a person here, not as a government, um, to help us make those social investments. I see, I see education as a social investment toward an outcome that is a social good in the future. We're, they're not also sitting at the table. We are going to be working this year through the clean network, supported by ESIP, to do exactly that. We need them at the table in combination with us with the government, state government, local government, and also corporate, and then the, the NGO, university, college sector, informal education. We need to be sitting at the table in a much more unified way than we've currently been doing. The cluster will give, afford us the opportunity to begin to build that structure and that approach. But they have got to start making those social investments with us, because um, we're not making it in the near term. And one last thing I'll say about this is, when I, when I was uh, asked to say, well, how much have we been doing in climate and global change education? And we had, in 2008, we started funding and it went up and around 2012, it peaked and then it's kind of tailing out the end of this year. So the last, there's a little bit of projects, but it's not anywhere near sufficient. It was about $140 million over that period of time of investment, federal, NSF, NOAA, and NASA. It turns out we've had four other spikes before We've had a spike in the 70s, 80s, 90s, two in the 2000s, and, and then one in, in, you know, beyond 2000, 2010. So we've had these spikes. What we need is a plateau. We need to go spike up and then slowly plateau up 
because this, this undulated fl fluctuations of, of priority, non-priority, priority, non-priority non is killing us. And we're not making the progress we need. So, you know, uh, that's, and, and if, if federal priorities change, somebody's gonna have to help us get to the, the in between the spikes, to fill in the, the gap between the spikes. Federal has gotta play a key role here. And we, we have done it five times. We're gonna come back again when the, the stars align again. But uh, we need somebody to help us make the trough a lot less uh, low. It's like zero now. I mean, but we're doing the, the community is responding, but the dollars aren't. So it's, it's kind of unfair to the community to ask them to continue to work pro bono. Uh, it's amazing. I love it. I take it and I enjoy it. But uh, it's not fair to them to keep on doing it on the back of, of goodwill. Um, so somebody's going to have to help fill that in. And I'm sure that this is not a new concept for you guys in other domains. Um, but anyway, I probably should stop there. Thank you very much for your time.